Bear with me one second. Thank you, Tomas. Um, forgive me. I'm not a practicing philosopher, nor am I very literate in the field of game studies, nor art history. I am a former, <laughs> former uh, AAA game maker turned indie developer who finds philosophical themes fertile ground for my own practice. And please understand that the rather sweeping and undisciplined claims which follow are not offered as systematic concepts, but as an attempt to express this internal relation with philosophy as an artist through external vocabulary. I hope you still find it relevant to the conference. So Brian Massumi considers video games a prime example of an oppressive and reductive system of action uh, when he writes of what he considers unsuccessful interactive installation art. The experience felt like a video game. You often feel there's a trick, a trick you need to find and master. And once you've done that, you lose interest because you've got the feel of it and you know how it works. But is the gaming paradigm fairly characterized as knowing how it works? My argument is that the epistemology of play specific to video games differs crucially from Matsumi's straw man. My claim is that an apophatic quality of not knowing is fundamental to the experience of playing video games. In saying this, I do not mean that players are troubled skeptics like David Hume, but that they happily accept their partial understanding of the game as a central feature of being a player in the game. I will illustrate this discussion through a case study of the cooperative crowd game Renga. John Sear and I created uh, this game in 2011 as part of our two-man collaboration, War 4. John is another former AAA developer and game design educator with one foot in academia. Renga runs on a custom platform inspired by Graffiti Research Lab's laser tag, but supporting accurate low latency tracking of up to 100 laser pointers shone from the audience to a screen uh, within a projected image at 60 frames per second. Renga was designed to support 100 players in one room for over an hour of focused cooperative gameplay. The games showing at IndyK 2012 in Los Angeles resulted in Renga winning the Developer's Choice Award, as voted by our fellow nominees. New media artist Golden Levin described it as a significant milestone, and game design theorist Eric Zimmerman called it the birth of a new genre. However, as a live event running on proprietary hardware, Renga was never released as such, though it did tour extensively uh, around 2012 and into 2013, including shows at GBC, South by Southwest, and the Toronto International Film Festival. As has been a design commonplace in video games since perhaps the late 90s, the first act of Renga employs an in-game tutorial with an immediate plunge into exploratory interactivity without any prior guidance. Renga's pre-show time displays a simple title screen with scrolling star field. Typically, some of the audience are already shining their laser pointers at the screen, but nothing happens in response. The show itself begins very subtly by rendering a small particle effect at the position of each tracked pointer. Suddenly, there is feedback the players quickly begin to realize that their pointers can have an effect on the image. This demonstrates that the lasers are being tracked quite accurately, but the tracking has no purpose, an open loop. After a little more time, excuse me, 
after a little more time, the house lights are lowered and the game proper begins as the title slide is replaced by a giant ring with small filled grey circles evenly spaced around its perimeter and radial lines converging from these circles to the centre of the ring. No on-stage host, no PA announcement, no in-game narrator, no on-screen text. The loop is closed and the audience are left alone to play. Most audiences had no idea what to expect when they attended a regular show. Many attendees knew in advance that regular was some sort of collaborative interaction via laser pointers, but that was all. So when the first ring appeared, it almost always provoked the same intended effect, instant confusion, and soon after that, experimentation. Typically within 10 to 20 seconds, a significant portion of the audience would have spread out around the perimeter, forming a circular formation with their lasers. This resulted in immediate feedback and a sense of a short-term goal as the radial lines began to shrink. Soon the first unlock ring, as we called them, was passed, and a short series of nested and rotating rings were advanced through, introducing some complications, reinforcing the sense of shared achievement, and leading the audience to the beginning of the first act proper. Although Renga is a somewhat unusual video game, the opening is fairly typical. The immediacy, the kinetic aspects, the unspoken invitation to explore, the fusion of haptic and visual qualities, and the deliberately provoked sense of mystery and intrigue of not knowing what to do. Traditional board games, by contrast, usually begin with a fairly lengthy period of reading the rules and discussing them before play commences. What are the elements? What can they do? How does play proceed? For example, the structure of each round. And crucially, what is the overall objective? Agreement must be reached before play. Why is this? What is the epistemological demand that board games make which video games lack? It, it is primarily, of course, as many have mentioned this week, the management of process and game state. Hence, the pre-game checking that all agree on knowing the rules in a board game. Video games, by contrast, usually rely on digital computers to manage a highly complex state and process. The inner workings are not readily available to the players. The ordinary player does not want to know and does not need to know the formal rules of the game they are playing. The video game world has secrets. It is esoteric, hidden, occulted. An objection might be raised at this point. Surely when Masumi wrote, you know how it works, he was not making a claim about knowledge of game rules at all, but that you know what to do. Yes, the rules of the game might be unclear, but isn't criticism that video games make what you must do all too clear? In this respect, there is a common pattern in many video games of short-term alternation back and forth between not knowing and knowing what to do as mentioned this week in the form of us and Grant's magic cycle. Isn't the repeated drip feed of satisfying little eureka moments and gratifying rewards, such as the Renga prologue unlock rings, exactly what Masumi finds distasteful and politically questionable about certain interactive art installations and video games in general? I can see that the short-term loop of puzzlement, learning and reward tends to produce a more tightly determined and choreographed performance of certain actions by the player than do many classic board games where what to do is in fact more open-ended, such as what next move to make in chess. But consider the longer-term game structure. At least on the first playthrough of a video game, the players have no knowledge of what comes after overcoming the short-term obstacle presented to them. In one sense, anything could happen next. The immediate task might suddenly give way to something quite different, as in the example of Playlist Limbo mentioned this week. We might say, although the situational affordances might be more constrained and become obvious, which is Masumi's concern, the project the players are working towards is unclear. The players do not know what is being done.
We can use Ringwood's fundamental ring mechanic as an illustration. The opening unlock rings educate the players from the outset to think about using their lasers in circular group formations. This mechanic is then elaborated across the rest of the first act as something that can occur in multiple places on the screen at the same time. The result is a very complex set uh, of shifting potential projects for action, none of which can be accomplished alone. Players must continually reassess whether the ring they are working on, if you like, is also an active project for other players in the collective. If it is not, they must rapidly reassess their allegiance and reevaluate where best to deploy their laser. Also, there is no master player but with greater knowledge. The overall experience is one of pursuing very short-term goals, I mean, on the order of one or two seconds or even less, within an obscure overall project. We can liken board game players' positive knowledge of the whole project of a traditional board game to the adoption of a cataphatic attitude in theology. There are positive statements we can make about the total context of our actions. We can know and say things about the absolute. Video game players, by contrast, experience apophasis. Their cognitive faculties are circumscribed in an unknowable whole. In the video game players' microcosm, However, knowledge and ignorance operate as a union of opposites, intertwined in a living contradiction. The dy a dynamic interplay between player and designer, we might say, between subject and absolute within that microcosm. Augustine of Hippo's 5th century notion of learned ignorance was developed at length by the 15th century theologian, philosopher, and Renaissance polymath, Nicholas of Cusa, in his uh, text on learned ignorance, or De Docta Ignorantia, employing the ancient motif of a coincidence or union of opposites. Cusanus describes the absolute as incomprehensibly understandable. Through the willful adoption of what I'm calling a playful ignorance, players know that they are playing a game while accepting that they are not in possession of the rules or even the goals. Certain video games resist rational attempts to gain them by, by comprehending the rules and reasoning consciously over possible strategies. As such, players are invited to embrace their necessarily partial understanding of the whole and surrender to a durational unfolding in which they must continually revise their measure of what they are playing at doing. Here I draw on Daniel Weller's concept of the ludic muse. I've built upon Jean-Luc Nancy's characterization of the work of art as bringing forth of experiencing the world as a particular kind of subject for example, as a seeing subject or a listening subject. Vela argued at this conference last year that games can provide us with an experience of ourselves as an acting subject and can function as artworks that support contemplation of our own subjectivity as, quote, active beings, acting on things in the light of our purposes. My purposes. <laughs> uh, we could say then that different games naturally invite or incite and an experience of our own subjectivity as different varieties of active being. As several speakers have alluded to this week, games can present the player to themselves as what we might call an enlightenment subject, deploying a calculative rationality. Um, but conversely, video games which invite playful ignorance present the player to themselves as a dancer to rhythms which are not their own, moving partially within an unknown whole. I would like to close by suggesting that certain games, such as Ringo, especially achieve this when presenting a continuous durational experience of motion in shifting fields of purpose, and that playful ignorance provides an experience of distributed agency. Admittedly, 
Continuous motion is not unique to video games or physical sports. The loop of awareness and reflection between the bodies of board game players sat around a table is continuous and fluid, even if the game proceeds by infrequent, discrete steps or turns. But the sub-perceptual high-frequency game loop running on a computer can simulate and manage far more activity than just that apparent to the players. Real-time simulation with complex state managed by a computer provides a fluid situation beyond the player's direct intersubjective relations in the physical context of playing the game in the room. I think. The game itself provides shifting complexity and has a momentum of its own, even for solo players. Through its ring mechanic, Renga goes further by making the entire laser swarm into a single multi limb a uh, multi limbed prosthetic avatar for the whole audience. Um, this is a good image of that, I think. Um, a collective body that resituates continuous intersubjective relations into a shifting field of screen space laser formations. In these ways, the video games can provide their players with an experience of distributed agency within an active field. As discussed previously, not only is the field shifting, but in a video game, the goalposts and even the rules are in motion. And through occulted processes, some of the motion is invisible, but felt. Rather than invest in a complex game balancing AI system, Renga actually relied upon an elaborate backstage system for real-time moderation of the game by John and myself via several devices, including a mobile phone, a tablet, and one or two, or one or sometimes two laptops simultaneously. Instead of appearing on stage at shows, we went to great lengths to hide this game jockeying, as my wife called it, or DJing especially the invariant dramatic structure and the fact that the timing was so carefully regulated by it. In keeping with Bella, players were given a carefully constructed experience of their own collective agency as powerful, coherent and successful. This is them defeating the, the end game boss and winning. In fact, it was not just the players who were performing, but all four, too, making sure that the audience experienced playful ignorance as leading to a satisfying outcome. This was always the outcome. I gradually came to see this as a ritualistic performance of playful ignorance for everyone in the theatre, John and myself included. We were all playing Renga but more like a piece of semi-improvisational symphonic music than a formal game between separate individuals. Perhaps it was operatic, a form mentioned by both uh, Leonardo, I think, and Dan this week. Was this a cynical manipulation of our audience of players? I do share the concerns of other authors that there are certain tropes found in video games which can aid in the exploitation of undesirable subjectivity. For many critics of gamification, the problem is the reliance on highly explicit goals which are extrinsic to the movement of play itself. For Masumi, in our opening quote from uh, Semblance and Event, however, the problem is more subtle. It is the reliance on intrinsic movements of play which are too obvious, too knowable. But I think that through Renga's combination of distributed agency with temporary shifting affordances towards an obscure goal, it did not seem closed, even though it was. Perhaps this is why it evoked a spiritual quality for some of its participants. Does this mean that Renga is an example of Kirkpatrick's uh, ludifaction from a paper last year? through, in this case, a fracking of the religious imagination. I leave this question open. Thank you. Thank you for this excellent timing. We have done with
there's no question. Some ignorant question. Um, thinking about the, the relationship you're drawing between um, the game that sort of conceals itself from the player and the, these sort of allusions to um, theological structures, and then starting to think about this group behaviour that you produced with Ranga and you know an evangelical church, where you had this sort of group dynamic of choreographing a mass number of people towards some sort of unified experience. How would you contrast what happened in Ringo to something like that um, curiosity, what's inside the cube thing, you know, totally different sort of goal, but similar sort of, is there a um, like former, contrast? Yeah, my former boss's game. Right. Um, yeah. And quite a big change of direction for Peter Money, but um, um, I think for us what was really key was um, synchronous, in room co presence of, of the players rather than asynchronous, um, dis, you know, distributed uh, multiplayer. And, and in fact, what, what gave rise to us doing this was, was uh, there was a lot of talk at GDC around 2009 2010 about so called social games, meaning Facebook games, which were booming at that time. And John and I both hated the term social 
when applied to those games. Mm. And we were like, well, we should make a real social game. So we were actually quite against uh, those other forms of networked uh, mass uh, achievement. Mm-hmm. Not that those Facebook games are like that, but yeah. Yeah. sorry, it's not a Oh, and just to, to focus the point is, do you find you achieve something different by having the outcome of something being that, that moment when the collectivity reached the goal compared to when the game state could have been finished by so many individuals? Is there something fundamentally different at that moment of culmination, especially in regards to sort of religious experience in the group? Well, yeah, I mean, there was always a euphoric uh, outburst at the very end, but in a way it was kind of a sad moment for everyone because it was the end of this experience of being together and then everybody moving back into their sort of normal anxieties and, and divisions. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe they didn't see it that way, but um, I think that the, 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 roof, the kind of, the real uh, intensity was along the way rather than at that end moment. Okay, with this uncomfortable feeling here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>